Hello and welcome. My name is Rich Barbuto, and my presentation today is entitled Seven Days in September 1814, The Turning Point in the War of 1812. Now, the War of 1812 uh, was started by the United States in a declaration of war uh, against Great Britain. But by 1814, America was in a crisis. America faced a massive loss of territory and the potential secession of New England. Successful military action precluded these catastrophic results to our young republic. And this is that story. Let's go to the start of the war. Napoleon was at war in Europe against most of, most of the countries of Europe, including Great Britain. And this had been going on for about a dozen years. Napoleon couldn't come to grips with Great Britain, and so he instituted the continental system. This forbade any British cargoes from entering any ports under French control. The British retaliated with the orders in council. This prohibited any neutral nations from carrying cargoes uh, into French ports. The upshot of this was that the British, the Royal Navy was capturing hundreds of American merchant vessels condemning the cargoes and keeping them. But what was worse than that is Royal Navy captains were coming onto American ships and drafting members of the crew who were born in the British Empire and bringing them onto the Royal Navy vessel. It's been estimated that us upwards on 12,000 American seamen had been drafted or impressed into the Royal Navy in the dozen years prior to the War of 1812. Additionally to that, French, uh, excuse me, uh, British fur traders in Canada were providing uh, natives in the United States, uh, Native Americans with weapons, muskets, powder, uh, lead uh, in trade for furs. Now the Native Americans were resisting the westward expansion of white settlement into the lands north of the Ohio River and, and into, uh, and into uh, uh, territories further west. The American settlers were utterly convinced that the British in Canada were inciting the Indians into this open warfare. Now, all of these things rankled American pride because Britain appeared to be treating America uh, with less uh, respect for their sovereignty that America believed it, uh, it should have. All of this led Congress to declare war in June of 1812. Now let's take a quick comparison between the British Empire and the United States. I wanna point out two things in particular. First, the navies. The Royal Navy had 120 ships of the line and 116 frigates. The United States Navy had a total of seven frigates. Clearly the Navy could not challenge the Royal Navy on the open sea. Let's also look at the numbers of regular soldiers. Uh, in Canada alone, uh, the British had over 10,000 soldiers. In January of 1812, the entire United States Army had fewer than 7,000 soldiers. Now there was a window of opportunity where the United States could declare and possibly win a war if it did so quickly because Napoleon and Britain were fighting in an existential conflict. President Madison's war goals were these, to persuade Britain to respect neutral shipping rights, to stop Britain from drafting American sailors, and to stop Britain from inciting the Indians in the West. The United States could not confront Great Britain in Europe. So Madison's strategy was this. He would seize Canada and then trade Canada back to Britain for these three concessions. Additionally, he would inflict commercial pain through privateering. Privateering was the arming of civilian uh, vessels, giving them the authority to capture merchant vessels of Great Britain. And this was entirely legal according to the laws of war in 1812. Now, if negotiations with Britons failed, then the United States would retain Canada. So how do you seize Canada? Well, there are two major cities in Canada, Quebec and Montreal. Canada was sparsely populated. There was a supply line from Quebec that brought in goods, supplies, food through Montreal, up the St. Lawrence River, 
uh, and through the Great Lakes uh, connected by the Detroit River and the Niagara River. So if the United States could cut that supply line at Montreal or preferably at Quebec City, that would starve the rest of Canada from British supplies and Canada, uh, excuse me, Great Britain would uh, sue for peace if that were to occur. So in 1812, there were three invasions. General Hull crossed the Detroit River, uh, invaded Canada, but he was soon thrown out by General Isaac Brock and Tecumseh at, at the head of uh, the, uh, his Confederation of Indians. So he brought uh, hundreds of uh, native warriors into the battle. Detroit was surrounded and Hull surrendered Detroit. Hull would be eventually court-martialed for that. In October of 1812, General Van Rensselaer of New York brought uh, 4,000 people to the Niagara River. He attacked with about 1,000 of them. The other 3,000 refused to cross the Niagara River because they were militia and the constitution said that they, could, they should not be ordered across uh, an international border. At the Battle of Queenston Heights, the American force was ultimately captured, sent off as prisoners of war, and that uh, invasion collapsed. In November, General Dearborn, who was the commander of all American forces, took a force from Plattsburgh, New York on Lake Champlain, north towards Montreal. In a snowstorm, the American troops fired upon one another. Dearborn pulled back into New York, called off the invasion, moved into Plattsburgh into winter quarters. So after the first six months of war, we have uh, great success by the United States Navy. Uh, they captured uh, or sunk four British warships without suffering any losses themselves. And the United States Navy captured 46 merchant vessels in that six month period. All of that was irrelevant because it was uh, hardly damaged the Royal Navy and the British could produce merchantmen as fast as privateers or the United States Navy might capture them. So now after six months of war, Detroit is lost. Michigan is under British governance. General Hull was court-martialed, he was condemned to death, and President Madison commuted the sentence. Native Americans are attacking across the West. Over 800 U.S. soldiers are in prison of war camps. Nearly 500 soldiers have been killed or wounded. The United States Navy was triumphant on the high seas, but that was entirely irrelevant to the prosecution of the war. The Royal Navy then ordered a blockade of the ports on the Atlantic and this started to shut down international trade. President Madison was under intense personal attack in the newspapers. An opposition party, the Federalist Party, was anti-war and opposition, and they were tireless in their efforts uh, to condemn Madison and the war effort. Now, 1813 opens up with a British strike. They sent a large squadron into the Chesapeake uh, Chesapeake Bay, the United States Navy can do just about nothing to stop them. And while they were there, they looted and burned plantations. They invited the enslaved population uh, along the Chesapeake Bay uh, to flee to British warships, and they were relocated in British uh, colonies in the Caribbean. And also the British burned four towns, looting, burning vessels. And in Hampton, Virginia, the troops got out of control and besides looting, there was rape and murder. The purpose of the British in the Chesapeake was to, to tie down American troops to keep them uh, from joining the invasions of Canada. Now, a good thing for American forces was in September of 1813, when Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry defeated the Royal Navy squadron on Lake Erie. This allowed the Americans to have total control of the lake and they could move troops and supplies uh, across the lake to invade Canada. William Henry Harrison, a future president of the United States, brought an army consisting mostly of Kentuckians into uh, Canada across the Detroit River, uh, freed Detroit, caught up with a British army and, over, and overran them, uh, destroying that column. And in the Battle of the Thames, Tecumseh is also killed and his confederation collapses. In 1813, there are four invasions of Canada, 
We talked about the first of Harrison across the Detroit River. Now in May, General Dearborn crosses the Niagara River, but after a series of battles, he's thrown back onto the river line. Uh, General Wade Hampton takes 4,000 men, leaves Plattsburgh, heading towards Montreal, and he's stopped cold by about 1,000 uh, Canadian militiamen at the Battle of Chateau Gay. Major General James Wilkinson leaves Sackett's Harbor. He brings 7,000 troops with him down the St. Lawrence River, heading towards Montreal. In a place called Chrysler's Farm, he is stopped cold by a much smaller force of British regulars and he returns to New York. So now, after 18 months of war, the nation is divided. The anti-war movement is very strong. Foreign trade has been all but shut down. The national debt is rising. Now, the British and the Americans agreed to peace negotiation, but the negotiations, but they could not figure out where they were going to conduct those negotiations. Therefore, the negotiations were at a standstill until later in 1814. Detroit was recovered. However, the British raided across the Niagara River and in a couple weeks time in December, burned every house along the river except for one in Buffalo. 6,000 New Yorkers fled the settlements along the Niagara River into the snowy woods uh, to escape the Indians that the British had unleashed. We already talked about the three invasions of Canada that were turned back. Now, in the Creek Nation, which occupies the land which is now the state of Alabama, a portion of the Creeks that Americans called the Red Sticks went into insurrection. And in doing so, they challenged uh, uh, the, the governors and the white settlements in the area, as well as the Creeks that were still friendly to the United States. The governors locally sent their militia in to put, uh, to put down the insurrection and eventually Andrew Jackson, early in 1814, destroyed the uh, Red Stick Army uh, in, uh, in Alabama. Now, Madison was at the lowest presidential approval, approval rating ever. He was reviled in the press. Uh, people were moving increasingly towards an anti-war stand. Between 1812 and 1814, customs had provided 90% of the federal income. However, revenues into uh, the treasury declined from 13.3 million in 1812 down to 4.7 million in 1814. The national debt rose from 48 million to 63 and a half million. War is expensive. And it's estimated that the consumer price index rose approximately 40%. Very few European goods were getting into the United States and very few American cargoes were making their way out of ports to Europe. The federal government was facing default. There was not enough money in the treasury just to pay the normal uh, bills, much less uh, provide enough revenue uh, for a, another invasion of Canada. Well, that window of opportunity closed. In April of 1814, Napoleon is defeated. The British now had tens of thousands of trained experienced troops and hundreds of warships that were no longer needed in Europe. Britain wanted revenge against America because America had stabbed Britain in the back while Britain was fighting the ogre Napoleon. The British wanted revenge and the Americans were reading this in the newspapers that came over from Europe. So how did Napoleon's defeat and the British resurgence appear to Americans? The Americans were waiting for the hammer blow to hit and it hit before too terribly long. Now, an American who was in London at the time wrote a long letter to James Monroe, the Secretary of State. I'm gonna read an extract from that letter. There are so many who delight in war that I have less hope than ever of our being able to make peace. You will perceive by the newspapers that a very great force is to be sent from Bordeaux to the United States. And the order of the day is division of the states and conquest. 
The more moderate think that when our seaboard is laid waste and we are made to agree to a line which shall exclude us from the lake, meaning the Great Lakes, and to give up a part of our claim on Louisiana, the session of New Orleans. Peace may be made with us. Now the British themselves articulated the same uh, thoughts for revenge. Admiral Alexander Cochrane wrote this letter to his boss. Now Cochrane commands all the Royal Navy on the Western Atlantic. So he'll be the one uh, invading uh, any part of the Atlantic coast that, that he cares to. I have it much at heart to give them a complete drubbing before peace is made. When I trust their Northern limits will be circumscribed and the command of the Mississippi rested from them. The negotiation opened up in Ghent and the British were, uh, uh, had several demands and the spirit of revenge and British commercial and fur interest pushed these demands. Now, the British commercial interests, the bankers, the shippers, wanted to resume trade with American ports. It was very lucrative. The fur traders in Britain wanted all the land south of the Great Lakes to, up to the Ohio River open to them for uh, trapping. So the demands were these. The creation of an Indian buffer state north of the Ohio River. Now this was a sine qua non. Now that included the state of Ohio. This was to be turned over to the Native Americans taken away from American sovereignty. And the British would then have fur trading rights within that area. The next demand was the removal of naval forces from the Great Lakes, the removal of American Navy from the Great Lakes. And finally, freedom of transit on the Mississippi River. That is to say they could transit the Mississippi River without paying any duties when they pass New Orleans. And this was uh, now a route that was open year, year round as opposed to the St. Lawrence River uh, that was closed during the winter. Well, these demands are just draconian and the American team uh, had to send back to Washington uh, for more instructions. Now the emperor, the empire indeed struck back. In August, a British force burned all the public buildings in Washington, DC, and a couple of the private dwellings as well. And in September, the British occupied 100 miles of the coast of Maine with every intention of taking that at the end of the war and bringing it into the state of New Brunswick. Then we have the seven days in September. First, the battle for Plattsburgh, second, the defense of the city of Baltimore, and third, the breakout of a division of troops from Fort Erie. And all of these affected British and American negotiations. So first off, the governor general of, uh, upper, of British North America, uh, George Prevost, took an army of 10,000 troops. He left Montreal heading south to, to uh, destroy the US uh, squadron at Plattsburgh and also to take all of Lake Cham Champlain into uh, the hands of the British. And a few days later, 9,000 of these troops ended up in Plattsburgh. Now the defenders of Plattsburgh were a Navy and an Army gentleman. Thomas McDonough commanded the Lake Champlain squadron. He had built it from scratch over the course of uh, two years. And at the end of that time, he was promoted to Master Commandant. Master Commandant is not a very uh, high rank. Uh, as you will recall, Russell Crowe was master and commander in the Royal Navy. Well, Thomas McDonough had the equivalent rank, but he carried the honorific title of Commodore because he uh, commanded an entire squadron of vessels. The land commander was Brigadier General Alexander Macomb. Now, Macomb's rise in the army was absolutely meteoric. At a time when you could uh, spend 20 or 25 years in the army and never rise above the rank of captain, Macomb was a Brigadier General. He was a trained engineer taking the engineer course at West Point. Uh, he was very competent. He was well liked by subordinates and superiors. He got along with his peers exceptionally well. 
And because of all this, he was given command of the army forces at Plattsburgh. Now, a quick talk about the, uh, the two navies that would meet in, uh, in Plattsburgh Bay. The Royal Navy squadron would show up for battle. The total throw weight of all of their ships was 2,146 pounds of iron. That is to say, if you weighed the, uh, the shot or shell from every gun in the squadron, it would weigh that much. The US Navy had much less throw weight, 1,907 pounds of iron could go uh, towards the British fleet at any time. And because of that, all things being equal in a, in a, in a fight uh, on the water, uh, the British would win because after a number of vo volleys, they would do more damage to the American fleet. So let's talk about the naval battle of Plattsburgh Bay. First, let me show you those three black squares next to the village of Plattsburgh. Alexander Macomb had built three earthen forts or redoubts across that neck of land. He brought his garrison into that small peninsula with the Saranac River on the left and the bay uh, on the right. Now, uh, it was a fairly strong position, except that if the British were able to pierce through those redoubts and get into the American camp, there was no escape for the Americans. There was no way out. Now let's turn to the naval battle. The American uh, squadron there, uh, McDonough is in the Saratoga. McDonough did not have enough troops, uh, excuse me, gun crews to man all of his guns. Therefore, he lined up his vessels in line, threw down anchors to, to, to keep them there, and his gun crews were on the starboard side uh, to man the guns there. What he had each ship captain do was put down several cables around the vessels from stem to stern and from stern to, to stem on both sides of the vessel. And these cables were connected to the capstan and when the crew members rotated the capstan, they would pull in these cables and rotate the warship 180 degrees. And this would allow all the guns on the port side now to be facing the British. So what would happen is each captain on his own, as he lost his guns on the starboard side, could wind his ship 180 degrees and have all fresh guns. The British sailed into Plattsburgh Bay and the winds were very light, so they were unable to pierce the American line, which was their intention. So each captain uh, put his own anchors down facing the American fleet, and they opened up a, a gunfight, a, a bombardment uh, that lasted over two hours. Now, when the Saratoga there in the center of this slide uh, is firing at the Confiance, which is the ship in the right-hand side of the, of the slide. The Saratoga wound 180 degrees with, and therefore firing all fresh guns. The captain of the Confiance attempted to do the same maneuver. And as he's winding his ship around, the American shot is going down the center line of the ship, uh, wounding and killing crew members such that the confines cannot complete that operation. They are now stuck at a 90 degree angle to the Saratoga. The Saratoga pours on shot and shell and the skipper of the confines strikes his colors. And when he does, the captains of the other British warships strike their colors, surrender to the Americans and the battle on the water is over. Now there is a land component to the battle for Plattsburgh. This is a comparative strength. The British bring 9,000 troops ready to go. The uh, American regulars under Macomb, 3,400, uh, and they are inexperienced. Many of them are very new soldiers. They're augmented by New York militia and Vermont volunteers, but still the total number of American soldiers is uh, smaller than that of the British army. So uh, it's not looking good uh, in a land battle. So while the naval battle is going on, the British leave their camp, cross the Saranac River, uh, and turn towards those three redoubts. And they're fighting a New York militia and Vermont volunteers every step of the way. They are ready to assault the three redoubts. The troops are anxious to, to attack. 
when General Prevost learns that he has lost the naval battle and he sends a note, an order to the general commanding the land attack, telling him to call off the land attack because a naval battle is lost and Prevost did not want any more uh, loss of, uh, of, of bloodshed uh, during that time. And so now the Americans have won the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay. They've destroyed the Royal Navy Squadron and Lake Champlain is retained for the Americans because it would take the British a year or two to rebuild a squadron uh, to challenge uh, control on Lake Champlain. Now let's turn to the defense of Baltimore. Baltimore is the third largest city in the United States. What you see here on this image is Fort McHenry in the center of the slide. You see the Royal Navy firing mortars, uh, mortar rounds to land inside of Fort McHenry. Now that's the, uh, uh, that is the view of the uh, bombardment of Fort McHenry at the time. Now, what actually happened is this. The Royal Navy squadron uh, enters from Chesapeake Bay, enters the Patapsco River, drops off about 4,000 infantrymen uh, who march uh, through that peninsula until they get to a narrow spot at the peninsula, a place called North Point. And there they are challenged by uh, Maryland militia who are trained, but they are outnumbered and they are inexperienced. Nonetheless, the militia give a very good account for themselves. And while they don't win the battle, they do withdraw under pressure, but it's an orderly withdrawal and they pull back to the defenses outside of Baltimore. And the British, uh, after resting a bit, continue the attack. So now, while the British commander on the land side is bringing his troops close to Baltimore, he discovers a long line of entrenchments and artillery batteries uh, facing him. He looks at the soldiers he has, he looks at those uh, fortifications, and he determines that he probably cannot win a battle, probably cannot get through uh, those line of fortifications. The Royal Navy commander uh, keeps his fleet out of distance, but he sends forward five uh, gunships. And these folks uh, on these gunships fire rockets and they fire uh, heavy duty mortars. They anchor about a mile and a half away from Fort McHenry. Fort McHenry is that little blue hexagon there. Fort McHenry is guarding the inner harbor and the British wanna bring their fleet into the inner harbor so they can burn Baltimore but the guns of Fort McHenry only reach out about a mile. So during a bombardment that lasts 25 hours, Fort McHenry can, can uh, not bring their guns to bear. So they're taking a punishment. Now this is what Fort McHenry looks like today. And it looked pretty much the same back in 1814. Of course, the, the uh, uh, structures on the inside of the fort uh, have changed over the years. But the outside uh, uh, of the fort, the hexagonal fort, I'm sorry, the uh, pentagonal fort is pretty much the way it was at the time of the battle. The Americans in Fort McHenry estimate that over 25 hours, the British have fired between 1,500 and 1,800 mortar rounds at them. And of these, about 400 land inside of Fort McHenry inflicting very few casualties because the Americans are hunkered down uh, in stone buildings and in deep trenches. At the end of this all, the British naval commander gets word that the land attack is not going to happen. He can't, the Navy cannot get past Fort McHenry. And so the uh, British Navy pull back into the Chesapeake Bay and Baltimore has been saved. The final battles uh, during these seven days is the, the, the lifting of the siege of Fort Erie. This is important because a division of American troops, about 2000, have been pushed back into the area around Fort Erie and the British outnumber them and are besieging them. Now this is what Fort Erie looked like at the time. Uh, it's very small, a couple stone buildings and, uh, and four bastions. So clearly 2000 troops can't fit into that small fort. So what the Americans did when they got to Fort Erie 
and you see Fort Erie at the top, a, they fortified a hill uh, in the bottom center of the uh, slide, Snake Hill, and they brought a lot of artillery to the top of that hill. They dug a trench line and threw up a parapet of dirt, uh, but connecting Fort Erie with Snake Hill. And then they brought in small trees to the area. They sharpened the, uh, uh, the limbs of the trees. They lay them side by side in a, in a thick mess. Uh, this is called an abatis, and it's the equivalent of barbed wire because it's very difficult for an infantryman to get through that mess of trees. But if they did, they would find themselves in a trench, and then they would have to climb up the top of that trench to get at the Americans behind the parapet. So it was, it was going to be difficult going. General Gordon Drummond is running the siege. And in August, he plans an attack. He's going to avoid the trenches and the parapet and the abatis. He's going to send a main attack at night uh, around the south end because his scouts say there's a hole in the abatis between Snake Hill and Lake Erie. He orders his soldiers to take the flints out of their muskets so you cannot accidentally discharge the weapon. And very stealthily, his troops move through the forest and then out of the forest and around looking for that hole in the abatis. Meanwhile, there will be two attacks coming in at the north. These are supporting attacks. Uh, and the mission of the supporting attack is to tie down American troops in the north so that the commander, the American commander, will not send reinforcements to the south where the actual uh, major incursion, incursion into the fort is going to uh, occur. Now, what happens in the darkness, the, uh, the troops, the British troops leave the forest, swing around, come towards uh, Snake Hill. American sentries, sentries hear them, fire their weapons, and as the British are approaching, all the guns on Snake Hill open fire at the British right below them. The British come to where they think is a break in an abatis and find out that the Americans have closed the gap. So the British cannot get into the fort and they're being uh, destroyed by the artillery and they withdraw back into the forest. Now up north, the two attacks coming into the northern part into Fort Erie, uh, one of the attacks is just thrown back by American firepower. The other attack actually gains one of the bastions of Fort Erie and hundreds of British soldiers are trying to get into the fort. They cannot break out of Fort Erie and the Americans cannot eject them from the fort. And then all the gunpowder in the bastion that the British were occupying explodes. And every British soldier in Fort Erie was either killed or wounded. It was a disaster for the British and here are the casualties. The hard part for the Americans is this. The Americans can't replace their casualties but the British can. More troops are coming over from Europe. So General Drummond has replaced uh, all of his 905 casualties uh, in quick order. Now over the next several weeks, the British bring uh, their siege guns into the edge of the woods north of Fort Erie. They set up three batteries. A battery is a position with one or more guns in it. And they're opening fire uh, into Fort Erie. Now they're pretty much firing down the length of the fort. So as the balls, uh, the shot and shell clear the walls of the fort, they land inside the American camp and explode. Every day, 10, 15, 20 Americans are killed or wounded and the wounded are evacuated across the lake, the Niagara River into Buffalo where they go into hospitals there. But it's diminishing the number of troops in Fort Erie. Now, the uh, American commander in Fort Erie at the time is Major General Jacob Brown. He figures that the only way to break the siege is for him to attack these batteries. So he comes up with a plan to do so, but he doesn't have the manpower he needs and there are no more regular troops uh, in New York available to help him. What he does is this, he orders out the local New York militia, and they all start assembling in Buffalo. And he sends Brigadier General Peter Buell Porter, a New Yorker, a former congressman, a war hawk, 
sends him into Buffalo to encourage the troops to volunteer to cross the Niagara River. Now remember, militia cannot be ordered out of the country. They can only do so if they volunteer to do so. Well, in a, a pouring rain, Porter uh, assembles all the troops and he gives them a very eloquent, eloquent plea pointing out all the Americans across the Niagara River who are uh, stuck in Fort Erie under siege, very possibly going to be killed or taken prisoner in the course of the siege unless the New York militia volunteer to cross the river to make this planned attack. And 2,200 out of 3,000 of the New York militia agreed to cross the river. General Brown's attack looks like this. The main attack will be under General Porter. He will sneak out of the camp in the south side. They will stealthily move through the forest and they will get on the a verge of the batteries. And when they are ready, they will attack battery number three. While that's going on, General Miller has got a uh, about a thousand troops of his own. He, they are hiding in a ravine between Fort Erie and the British batteries. When Miller's men hear Porter's men start the attack, Miller's men will scramble out of the uh, ravine and they will attack into the woods. The two columns will meet at battery number two. Now the plan goes off pretty much as, uh, as scheduled. Porter's men get to uh, uh, battery number three. The British haven't detected them. The uh, Americans sweep across battery number three. Now it's in a drizzle at this time. So the gunpowder, a lot of it uh, isn't working. So the men can't fire their muskets. The fight is hand to hand with bayonets. Uh, the Americans plow through battery number two, capturing it, uh, destroying the guns. They're moving on to battery one. Now, while all this is going on, most of the British soldiers are in a camp about a mile and a half to the north. When the battalion commanders there hear the fight uh, at the batteries, they assemble their men and they uh, counterattack uh, and they end up between batteries one and two. So now there's a hellacious fight going on there. The Americans have done what they set out to do. They're given the order to withdraw and it's a fighting withdrawal all the way back into Fort Erie. The Americans believe that by destroying the guns, they have broken the siege. And indeed, the British withdraw over the next several days and lift the siege themselves. What the Americans didn't understand at the time is that General Drummond had decided uh, that he couldn't supply his men on the siege line. And so he was lifting the siege on his own and he had already given out orders to move the guns. Now, this was a uh, tremendous fight with a lot of casualties. And here's the listing. What I wanna point out here is the loss of the American leaders. Brigadier General Davis of the New York militia, he's killed at the head of his troops. Uh, he made his, uh, brought his brigade all the way into battery number one. Lieutenant Colonel Eleazar Wood, uh, West Point graduate, uh, who's an engineer, but he's commanding infantry. He led one of the columns, he's killed in the attack. Colonel James Gibson is killed at the head of his troops, and Generals uh, Ripley and Porter are both wounded. On the British side, three of the British battalion commanders who led counterattacks into the fight, again at the head of their soldiers, and three of them are very seriously wounded. Now, at the bottom of the screen, you see uh, three images. On the left, this is a portrait of James Gibson. Uh, West Point graduate, again, a meteoric rise in, uh, in rank uh, from ensign uh, to full colonel in, in a matter of years. Uh, on the right, we have the Wood Memorial. General Brown, out of, out of his own pocket, um, wanted to, to commemorate the life of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eliezer Wood. And he uh, had this monument raised this obelisk and is sitting today at the West Point Cemetery. Now in the center picture, you recognize the Statue of Liberty. While this battle is completed, Governor Daniel D. Tompkins of New York is in New York City overseeing the construction of fortifications in the harbor because he expects a British attack on New York City like the one 
that went in against Baltimore. Now, the forts are not named until the construction is done. However, Daniel uh, Tompkins, the governor, decides to name two of the fortifications in the harbor. One of them is on Ellis Island, and he names that Fort Gibson. The second one is on Bedloe's Island. He names that Fort Wood. Now, Bedloe's Island has since become Liberty Island. And you see the Statue of Liberty sitting atop a pedestal, and the pedestal is sitting atop the, the stonework of Fort Wood. So when you go to visit the Statue of Liberty and you go into the pedestal, you're passing through a gate that is Fort Wood, named after one of the heroes of, uh, of the siege of, uh, of Fort Erie. Now, what does that all mean for the war? Well, Britain's most celebrated military commander is Arthur Wellesley, the, the Duke of Wellington. He's defeated the French in Spain and in Portugal. Uh, Napoleon has been kicked out of the country. The Allies have occupied uh, France, and Wellington is named as the ambassador from Britain to France, and his position is in the city of Paris. Paris is seething. The Parisians want to restart the, the war. Uh, France is ready uh, to continue the wars. The Allies, uh, including Britain, are currently in Vienna trying to figure, the Congress of Vienna, and trying to figure out what the post-war situation in Europe is like. And it was uh, uh, a lot of difficulty there. The Allies were not seeing eye to eye. The British ministry wanted to get Wellington out of Paris because they learned that he is the target of an assassination. They have two choices. They can send him to Vienna to be a diplomat, uh, and that would be plausible. But what they really want to do is send him to America to take command of all British forces in America to finish the war. They send a note to Wellington explaining what they want to do, and they end the note with this. We are ready to place the decision entirely in your hands. Does he go to Vienna? Does he go to America? We only request that you will lose no time in leaving Paris. Wellington has other ideas. He looks at what's going on in America and he writes this. That which appears to me to be wanting in America is not a general but naval superiority on the lakes, meaning the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. The question is whether we can acquire this naval superiority on the lakes. If we can't, I shall do you but little good in America, and I shall go there only to sign a peace which might as well be signed now. Now, the Americans control Lake Erie and Lake Champlain uh, up for grabs as Lake Ontario between the two. He further analyzes the situation. I think you have no right from the state of war to demand any concession of territory from America. Remember, Britain had gone in with demands for all of America north of the Ohio River and clearing the Americans away from the Great Lakes. You have not been able to carry the war into the enemy's territory and have not even cleared your own territory of enemy forces. There are Americans there along the Niagara River and uh, out uh, west near Detroit. You cannot on any principle of equality in negotiation claim a cession of territory. He ends up with this. Then if this reasoning be true, why stipulate for the uti posidatis? Uti posidatis is a diplomatic term. It means at the end of the war, whatever you possess at the end of the war, you get to keep. So it's a transfer of territory. You can get no territory. Indeed, the state of your military operations, however creditable, does not entitle you to demand any. So the ministry thinks about that for a while and is going to issue new instructions to the negotiating team. Now, I've got a few more remarks and then we'll go to a live audience Q&A. So if you have a question, please type it into the YouTube chat box at this time. The British government considerations in changing 
the demands uh, against America are these. Wellington has convinced them that they won't lose the war, but they probably can't win the war given these three recent American victories. The negotiations in Vienna are going very poorly and it's entirely possible that there will be a war in Europe between the erstwhile allies uh, who had uh, conquered France and thrown Napoleon out of the country. France might resume the war on their own. The British have a huge national debt and in order to continue the war in America, they would have to raise new taxes. And there was great opposition to that. Again, pressure from the commercial interests who want to very quickly reopen commerce with American ports. And Wellington's analysis had put the matters into very sharp relief. The British change their negotiating position from uti posidatus to status quo antebellum. So what they're telling the Americans is this, let's stop the war now. Uh, you get to keep whatever territory you had um, prior to the war. The Americans leap for the chance at peace and the negotiating team and the British uh, uh, come up with a peace treaty. And on Christmas Eve, they sign the Treaty of Ghent. That treaty goes to London, Parliament ratifies it very quickly. The treaty gets put on a, a boat and sent across the uh, Atlantic and it ends up in Washington, DC. The uh, Senate ratifies the treaty and the very next day, uh, the president, President Madison, Madison signs the peace treaty and the war is officially over. But of course, in that time between signing of the treaty and ratifying the treaty, Andrew Jackson has won a stunning victory at the Battle of New Orleans. The war is now over. The results of the war are these. Britain, and indeed much of Europe, is a little less contemptuous of that republic, the United States. There is a new awakening of American nationhood, born of pride and confidence. As far as they're concerned, they won the last battle of the war, New Orleans, uh, and so, to their mind, they won the war. This catapults Andrew Jackson onto the American stage, and of course, he's going to be president. The Native Americans who uh, fought during the war are all but subdued. The Creek, the Red Sticks have been destroyed. Uh, Tecumseh's dead. His confederation has pretty much died with him. So the Indians can no, no longer put up an active um, uh, resistance to American settlement in the West. The opposition party, the anti-war party, the Federalist Party disappears at the national level. So these are the results of the War of 1812, and we're going to open this to questions, but I'm going to put another slide on right now uh, while we're answering the questions. Uh, and this is the next CGSC presentation with the Dole Institute of Politics. And on the 5th of November, uh, Professor Jeff Babb uh, is going to give a presentation, Spring 1944, The Turning Point in the China, Burma, India Theater of World War II. So now we'll see if we have uh, questions. Our first question is this. One of the major issues at Vienna was the Polish-Saxon crisis, which involved how much territory Prussia and or Russia would gain at the peace talks. And I'm looking for a question there. And I'm not seeing a question come forward from that. So anyway, I thank uh, Professor Abel for that, uh, that statement. We'll see if that uh, evolves into a question. Did the British government really want serious territory from the US for Canada, or were they just looking to break some off for Indian groups to destabilize the United States? Excellent, excellent question. They wanted to stop uh, any further westward expansion. And they wanted to, they thought they might 
reward the Native Americans for their participation in the war. So they were serious and they wanted the fur trade in uh, the territory, the, nor the Northwest Territory in the United States, everything north of the Ohio River. They really wanted to open that up to British fur traders. Um, so they were serious about that right up until the point that uh, the Duke of, of Wellington convinces them that they really do not have the uh, justification for those kinds of demands. They had not a single British troop in any area that they were, uh, that the Native Americans were in. Uh, and so as Wellington said, they, they really had no uh, uh, justification for continuing on with that demand. Certainly that would have destabilized the United States uh, if the US could not move uh, uh, into the territories uh, north of the Ohio River. They would be constricted or uh, to any expansion south of the Ohio. And let's see if we have another question. All right, I don't see any further questions coming. So with that, I wanna thank you all for, uh, for being here today, for listening to this presentation. I wanna thank the Dole Institute of Politics for allowing me to give this presentation uh, and the cooperation between the uh, Army, US Army Command and General Staff College Department of Military History and the Dole Institute. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, attending this presentation today. Thank you.